So hi everybody, my name is Dawn. Um, I am the program coordinator for Keep Darn Beautiful. And thank you so much for joining us today to celebrate America Recycles Day with our very first ever Durham Recycles webinar. Um, let me see if I can share my screen. So today we're going to have some presenters with us, um, but first a little bit of housekeeping. Um, please remain on mute to minimize any noise and distractions for both our audience and our presenters. And today we're gonna hold all of our questions until the end of the presentation. Um, afterwards, you can either unmute and ask your question or you can just use the chat box and feel free to put any questions that you have in the chat box um, while the presentation is going as well. So uh, please allow me to present our pre presenters today. Um, we're gonna have Kevin Fisher, the procurement manager for Sunoco Recycling, Muriel Willman, senior assistant solid waste manager at the city of Durham solid waste management and a superstar for all things sustainability. Um, Chrissy Corvui, solid waste program manager at Durham County government. Meredith Marley, Marley, the owner of Shimar Recycling and Kristen Schillings, the marketing and development for Green Zone Recycling. Um, first, I'll tell you guys just a little bit about Keep Durham Beautiful so that you know who we are and why we're here. So Keep Durham Beautiful is an environmental nonprofit founded in 2004 with three main focus areas, litter prevention, waste reduction, and community greening. And today's event falls under that waste reduction category. And we really work to foster an environmentally resilient uh, Durham by forming partnerships with organizations, individuals like you, city and county folks like Muriel and Chrissy, and then helping those um, using our resources and using those changes uh, to make, to help residents make change in their communities. And we are going to start with um, Kevin. Thank you, good morning, everyone. My name's Kevin Fisher, I work for Sunoco Recycling. I see a lot of familiar faces and names from this group. Uh, it's an honor to, to speak in front of you all. Uh, I've been with Sunoco Recycling since 2005, and majority of the time in this market, and I handle account development for four of our recycling plants, our Durham facility, Raleigh, Jacksonville, and Wilmington, North Carolina. What I want to do today, just to talk a little bit about Sunoco Recycling and then um, go into what we can take and what we cannot take, and some challenges we are facing in, in the industry and or at our local facilities. Don, do you have my presentation or do you need me to put it up? Um, I don't think that I received yours, so if you... If somebody can uh, make Kevin a co-host and he can share his screen with us. Either Chrissy or Muriel, I don't know if you have that power. I'm trying, I can't, I can't do it. Okay. I need to stop sharing. No, I can just send it to you real quick. No, that's okay. It will be easier to do it this way. Sorry, everybody, this is our very first time doing this, like I mentioned, so you get to be part of the making of this, what will hopefully be something that we do more often. <laughs> All right, Kevin, your co-host, you should be able to share now. Thank you. Can everyone see it? I think you're good. All 
So I like to tell people who, who Sunoco Recycling is. Uh, people may not know, but if people have worked with us, with us in the past, they, they do know us well. Uh, we're a, a division of Sunoco Products Company based out of Hartsville, South Carolina. Um, primarily, Sunoco Products is a, a packaging provider, consumer packaging, and industrial packaging services. Uh, all across the world, uh, over 330 plants, probably up to 25,000 employees at this point. Uh, Sunoco Recycling has 22 facilities in the Southeast. That doesn't include our, our 12 paper machines throughout the U.S. On an annual basis, we process over 3 million tons, and that could be cardboard, paper, junk mail, magazines, bottles, cans, glass, and so forth. As we go into the local market, we have two facilities, one in the, our regular recycling plant in Durham, and then we have our Sunoco recycling facility in Raleigh, which is a, a fully operational material recovery facility. And there we, we sort out various types of residential curbside recyclables. So I'd like to talk to people about what we can take. And um, several of you have probably seen these uh, pictures before, but I'd just like to reiterate plastic, bottles, tubs, jugs, and jars. Uh, very easy to identify here. And then on the right-hand side, metal containers. Uh, that would be what we call aluminum containers, metal, soup cans, so forth. We ask, uh, you know, just the common public to empty and rinse the containers on some of the plastic containers. Uh, please take the pumps off, uh, that, that's also helpful. Drilling down further, uh, glass and paper we do take, and that's glass containers, uh, general soda bottles, beer bottles, wine bottles, uh, tomato uh, containers. And then on the right-hand side, our, our paper board, or, or, and that consists of magazines, newspaper, cardboard, magazines, junk mail. Um, you see the, the spiral containers and the snack chips and the paper towel rolls also. Um, and then the, the most common uh, thing we see is we like to say, keep, keep this material out. Um, batteries is, and I'll get into batteries a little bit later, electronics, styrofoam, shredded paper, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about shredded paper, uh, medical waste, plastic bags, um, and, and please do not um, bag the recyclables. If anyone's come to our facility, we've talked about that before. And uh, we try to stress the bags. So um, we went with the stuff that we can take, and now we're into the stuff that we cannot take. Um, Kevin, can you explain really quick why you don't want plastic bags? I know, sure. but I feel like a lot of the people here might not. Yeah, absolutely. Plastic bags, um, they'll come across our line. Our, our, our employees don't have the time to just rip those bags open. And, and in some cases, if they get to our employees, um, they may be shredded. And um, at that point, we don't know what's inside the bag. Um, but the bags create what we call tanglers in our system. We have uh, rubber discs that um, sort of cardboard and paper and containers, and these bags get caught up in those discs. So, Twice a day, we have to shut our line down and clean those discs out. And, and it's a very unsafe practice to do because of the, the, the way that the discs are angled. And it just takes time to do that. And when, when we're not running, we're cleaning our, our machines. That means we're not processing any material. But uh, most of your grocery stores will take the the plastic bags back, but take it one step further and don't even use plastic bags. Go to a lot of um, people use the, they bring their own bags. Um, uh, I'm sorry, the, the name skips me, but they're not plastic bags, but I know we have, we bring our own uh, bags to the grocery store and just fill them that way. So it's, uh, we're not even using the plastic bags. So is that answer? Kevin, uh, can I interrupt and ask you to put it in presentation mode? So that it's a large, it's large screen for everybody. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, and, uh, uh, 
I don't see where I can do that. I think set up slideshow or from current slide. From current slide, I think we'll get you. In the top left, yep, right there. How's that? Much That's better, good. thank you. Yeah, good questions. I was looking for it earlier. I'm glad someone's been walking through it. Thank you. Don, any other questions on? Um, no, please continue. Okay. Um, the last slide here is, you know, what challenges do we face um, at, at our Merck and Raleigh? Uh, I just walked through the, the plastic bags, but uh, I right now the batteries is probably our number one concern. And these are lithium ion batteries. Uh, they create fires in, in facilities like ours and have um, completely destroyed some facilities across the country. Uh, that should be our, our, our top challenge over bags at this point. If, if anyone again has come to our Merck, we've talked a lot about bags, but the batteries have really been a concern over the last year and a half. Uh, I like to kind of where can the public go with these batteries? I think a Home Depot or a Best Buy sometimes has drop centers, and sometimes your local municipalities may have drop centers. So please, uh, the importance of no batteries going into, into a residential curbside program is essential. Um, we have fires more often than you can think of it at, at our Raleigh facility because of this. Uh, once they get into our, our MERP, uh, they become combustible and they can easily catch fire and, and just think of all the paper and other product that we have in a facility like, like that. Um, I talked about uh, shredded paper uh, for a minute. Uh, shred, shredded papers can be recycled, but can it be recycled through your residential program is a, is a whole other question. And what we like to tell people is that something is smaller than a posted size note, it shouldn't go in that recycling bin because it's generally going to fall through our streams or our sorting equipment. And therefore, we say shredded paper obviously is small, even if you bag it up in a paper bag, that bag is going to get ripped by the time it gets through our machines. So I just ask that shredded paper uh, be eliminated from the residential program. And again, there's shred events going on uh, throughout the year at, at banks, at local municipalities. You just have to be aware of when those events are. Uh, scrap metal, uh, you know, we advertise metal that we can take metal, but it's really metal containers. Um, it's very common if you walk through our facility to see uh, propane containers, uh, pots and pans, uh, metal car parts, uh, anything that's not a, a household container. Just think about that. Is, um, we, we don't want that material in our facility. Again, that being dangerous in some cases, but also can cause um, severe harm to our equipment if it's a large piece of metal. And then finally, flexible packaging uh, that goes along the same lines as, as plastic bags. So a lot of flexible packaging will have um, a, a, a label on the back that says it can be recycled, but you have to ask further in your local uh, processor, can they take it? And, and there are some processors that are taking flexible packaging across the country. We're just not set up at this point to have flexible packaging. And if anybody doesn't know, flex Flexible packaging is a potato chip bag, an Oreo cookie um, bag, uh, similar to plastic, just got a, a bit of a more shiny tone to it and a little bit thicker. Awesome. Thanks, Kevin. Um, am I correct that you have to leave leave us at 12? No, I'm, I'm good to stay on. Okay, you're good to stay on. All right. Well, we have a few questions that I will save until the end then, since you'll be with us the whole time. Okay, and up next we have Muriel. I think Muriel was going to share a quick video with us first before going into her presentation. Yes, I am. Thank you so much. Welcome everyone. I'm so excited to be here at the inaugural uh, Keep Durham Beautiful America Recycles Day celebration. Um, so I am going to share um, I've been letting people into the meeting, so while I'm doing this, I can't do that. Um, but I got you. 
Thank you. I would encourage everybody to turn up the volume. We had a little uh, muffling earlier, but this is, um, bear this video in mind when I go into my presentation. Josh, Emma, and Oliver. They grow our food, run our hospitals, and develop our digital infrastructure. Their equipment, supplies, the tools they use came from recycled materials. This combine here was made in part from a recycled washing machine. The high quality metal that makes up Emma's stethoscope came from a recycled car. And Oliver's computer was once an outdated cell phone. The recycled materials industry provides a renewable source of high quality materials for the everyday items and essential infrastructure we depend on. Uh -uh. Muriel, I don't, maybe since you muted, it won't do sound. In fact, every new item made from recyclable material is one less item that would have used our scarce natural resources. With recycling, we can get raw materials locally and securely with less dependence on imports. And the recycled materials industry is continuously innovating to recycle more material more efficiently using artificial intelligence and optical scanners to recycle items that were once considered hard to recycle. From our farms, to our hospitals, and across our communities, recyclable materials keep our supply chains running and provides us with the tools we need for the future. More about recycling at isre.org. Awesome. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again with Muriel's presentation. And then Muriel, you can just let me know when you're ready to go to the next slide. Okay, we'll do. Fantastic. Um, so bearing all that in mind, obvious, whoops, Oops. back to the beginning. So um, as John mentioned, I am the uh, Senior Assistant Solid Waste Manager for the City of Durham. Um, I manage the Waste Disposal and Recycling Center that is located at 2115 East Club Boulevard, right in the center of our city. Um, and it is, you can change the slide. It is a full service uh, center with multiple facilities inside. I hope that some of the people on this call have been there, but in case you haven't, what I'm gonna do is do a really brief tour. Um, we're already, uh, I'm just gonna whip through and um, if there are any questions at the end, I'll answer them. So anyway, if you've never been there, the facility has two scale houses, three scales, a regional transfer station, a full service convenience center, and a type one yard waste composting facility. Next slide. I'm gonna go ahead and go through all of the elements of the uh, facility, starting out with the scale houses. If you have ever been to our facility, this is the first place that you probably need to go um, because we do charge for every uh, bit of, uh, I'm going to throw some acronyms at you guys, MSW, which is Municipal Solid Waste. And uh, we need to actually keep all of this data for the state. The state requires an annual report from facilities such as this across the state. And we need to keep track of where the tonnage is coming from and how much tonnage and of what material. And the state requires us to report this on an annual basis. So the scale houses are very, very important, not just to take your money, <laughs> but also to keep track of this data. And I'm going to use some of that data throughout this, uh, throughout this presentation. So we do charge $54 per ton for uh, municipal solid waste, $29 per ton for yard waste. And uh, we have variable rates depending on the type of vehicle that comes in. Um, and uh, if you are bringing in residential recycling, there is no charge whatsoever. So this is one incentive for people to reduce waste and leading into the video that you just saw, keep those materials above ground. Because once it comes to the tipping floor at the transfer station, it's only headed in one direction and that is to the landfill. Um, this facility, this part of the facility sees over 1800 people each week. So if you have to uh, wait in line a little bit, sorry about that, but it is a really busy place. We recently added this um, scale that's uh, 
uh, bright red visible there on the left. Um, just this past year, we opened up our third scale, and we're really excited about that. It's helped our throughput considerably. Next slide. So the transfer station, a lot of people, um, I mean, to my astonishment, a lot of people think that uh, the city of Durham still has a landfill open and operating. We do not. It closed in, I think, 1994, maybe five. And um, in the absence of a landfill, you end up with a transfer station. And basically, you can see from the picture, it's really like a big garage type space. We've got enormous bay doors that can accommodate the lift gate of garbage trucks, um, large roll-off trucks, and other uh, heavy equipment that comes in. Um, and the municipal solid waste is piled up against the back wall and picked up by this looter. On the right corner of this uh, photograph, you can see a trailer. And that is sitting on top of a scale when it achieves weight that trailer will get pulled out and hauled to the landfill we are contractually obliged to bring our garbage to um, the landfill in roseboro north carolina the sampson county landfill so when you throw something away in durham this is where it goes it goes to the transfer station and then it gets hauled out all the way to sampson county the transfer station also serves another purpose it actually also transfers our recycling. Uh, the materials that Kevin just described uh, go into one bay. Um, it would be probably no surprise that two thirds of the transfer station are dedicated to MSW, municipal solid waste, and one third of it is dedicated to single stream commingled recycling. And so similarly, the way that the solid waste gets transferred out and hauled to Sampson County, the uh, single stream recycling gets transferred out and hauled directly to Sunoco. So uh, I did a little bit of math and currently about 12% of our um, aggregated material that's managed at the transfer station is recycling. So this is what we call the recycling rate. It's not the same as, um, as you know, the amount of uh, recycling that's actually collected, but this is a rate that's often used in solid waste circles. So Durham currently has a 12% recycling rate, which is arrived by adding the MSW and single stream recycling and then dividing that by the number of uh, of recycling. Um, I think it's interesting to think about what's happened over the last couple of years. I was looking at this data and um, during the pandemic in uh, 2021, our, um, our MSW really spiked. It went up 10,000 tons during the year of 2021. And we're back down actually to lower than pre-COVID numbers. Um, still, you know, a pretty big number, 158 uh, 1,464 tons of MSW. Also interestingly, I thought, is that single stream recycling has also gone up from the previous year. So our MSW has gone down, our recycling has gone up in the last year since COVID. Next slide. I'm a huge fan of a waste characterization study. This one was done uh, by the city of Durham and released back in 2016. And I would encourage anyone who's here, you're probably interested in your in uh, reducing waste and recycling, do your own waste characterization study. Gather up all of the garbage that you accumulate and see what percentages are recyclable, not recyclable, compostable, are they donatable, are they reusable, go ahead and comb through. The city of Durham did this, um, you know, a little while ago, and uh, this is what they found out. Appro approximately 28% of, this is from single, uh, excuse me, from single family homes, single stream recycling in single family homes. It's a little bit of a tongue twister, but almost 30% um, of what is currently going into the landfill, or at least this was true in 2016, is truly recyclable, readily available material that could be going to Kevin and our colleagues at Sunoco. So I think a lot of people like to drill down into you know, different types of plastics and things like that. But the point is that we are not capturing very basic materials, bottles, cans, 
jars, and paper. They're still going into the landfill. It's actually North Carolina state law that aluminum cans and plastic drink bottles not be landfilled. There's no teeth necessarily. We don't have aluminum can or plastic bottle cop standing at the transfer station to turn them around. It's really up to us as individuals to know what is recyclable. Pick it up off the ground. Get it in the recycling container. Talk to your neighbors. We can get this number down and that um, recycling rate up. They also found that about 30% of the waste stream is food and low-grade paper, paper towels, things of that nature um, that could be composted. And they found, and this will be, uh, this is tied to a speaker that'll be coming later, uh, textiles was 10%. So textiles and organics are interesting because they are the heaviest of the material. If you know we're hauling our waste 90 miles to Sampson County, the heavy materials, that's what's burning the gas, the wet materials, that's what's creating leachate and methane from a landfill. Anything that we can do to keep these materials out is for the good. And we do have ways to do that. Next slide. All right, so that's the transfer station. Now I'm gonna move on to the convenience center. If you've been here, it can be a thumping joint. We've got um, facilities to accept MSW, that's municipal solid waste again. That includes bulky items and yard waste that we charge for. Um, but we also have a lot of free services, recycled and what we call universal waste. Universal waste are material that are banned from landfill disposal and can be recycled if they're put in the proper place. That would be household hazardous waste. A lot of those materials are universal waste, scrap metal and appliances, electronics, scrap tires, and of course we recycle textiles even though there isn't any rule that says we need to. It was the low-hanging fruit from the waste characterization study, so the city grabbed it. Next slide. The Household Hazardous Waste Collection is one of our crown jewels. If you've been here, you know Antoine Freeman. He is what I call our Goodwill Ambassador. He knows everyone, and he talks to just about everybody that, um, that comes through. Uh, if you pull in through the HHW, what we're hoping to collect there is anything that says danger, toxic, poison, warning on the label. Uh, we don't want that going into the landfill. We don't want that going on the tipping floor, number one, where it can be hazardous to uh, people there or to, of course, the landfill in Sampson County. But again, we have to rely on residents to separate the materials and bring it to the proper place. So by far the largest amount of material that we get is paint over and above any of the other material. But we also take uh, cleaning chemicals, um, pesticides, herbicides, gas. You can see uh, Antoine is emptying out a, um, a gas can for somebody, returning that container to the customer. And um, uh, all of the materials that he processes are going to go over land. They're going to be shipped to um, the uh, uh, EcoFlow processor depending on the material, it might get recycled or it might get incinerated or it will go into a, um, a hazardous waste landfill. And if you think that a MSW landfill is hard to site, hard to manage, then imagine what a hazardous waste landfill is like. Anything that we can do to use up our materials so that we don't have to bring it here or better yet, try non-toxic alternatives. I love to clean with, you know, vinegar. I clean my drains recently. I used uh, baking soda and vinegar and chased it with boiling water, cleaned my own drains, completely toxic free. So um, there's lots of, there's lots of non-toxic alternatives. However, fluorescent lights, things like that, those are also getting replaced largely by LEDs. But if you do have fluorescent lights, fluorescent tubes, we want to capture that mercury. Next slide. Bring it to the HHW unbroken. Other materials, Kevin mentioned batteries. Uh, we do accept household batteries. We get three tons of household batteries every year here at the Convenience Center. I'm here with two of my colleagues, uh, Larry and Jonathan. And um, Jonathan is actually our electronics uh, um, recycling uh, processor. I'll talk about that in just a moment. But Kevin mentioned lithium batteries. You can do us a solid by taping the terminals on batteries. Uh, if there's a live, you know, uh, nine volt batteries, they've got the, the um, female and male terminals there, positive and negative, I should say. 
put a piece of tape over it, lithium batteries, those silver discs, put it inside um, a, a masking, not masking tape, a scotch tape, either side masking tape will work too. If you have lithium batteries, separate them out into a little baggie. It's something that Antoine does um, while he's processing the batteries. So if that's something that residents can do, that would help us a lot. All the other stuff is separated according to the material, used oil, antifreeze, and cooking oil. We also recycle um, uh, cooking oil and fats and that gets um, recycled into biofuel and other products such as makeup. All right. Um, I have, I, I didn't get a good shot of our textiles. This is from our, uh, one of our security cameras. So FY to the eye, if you are at the center, you are on camera. Um, but that's a little glimpse of our, our textile box that's right near the entrance, 11 tons. We don't get paid for all of the material that we recycle, um, but some of it we do and textiles is definitely one of those. Next slide. All right, moving on. E-waste, electronic recycling. Like I said, Jonathan Anderson, he's the fellow that uh, manages every single ounce of the 732 tons, oh, sorry, 193 tons of electronics that come through our center. And 130 tons of that material comes from televisions alone. We are still getting those big console televisions that are encased in wood. You know the ones I mean, like their furniture, maybe in your grandparents' house until they finally decide that they're gonna let that go and that comes to us. And that's over a hundred pounds of um, CRTs, cathode ray tubes. They're lined with lead. We do not get money for those. They are costly for us to manage. However, along with those CRTs also come uh, computers and other materials that contain precious metals like silver, gold, platinum, rare earths, nickel, lithium. All of these can be recycled, all of these can be recovered, and so we do get a rebate for our electronics. We do not allow any scavenging. The materials that are valuable to our market, we sell to a company called Powerhouse. The same material that um, is valuable to Powerhouse is also valuable to scavengers, and we don't want that. So I'm afraid that we don't allow any scavenging of our electronics. There are some uh, charities that do accept uh, computers for upgrading. That would include Triangle eCycle, the Cramden Institute. If there's some way that you can upcycle your computer and get it to someone, you know, to bridge that digital divide, I highly encourage you to. But if not, then we'll definitely recycle that material for you. Scrap metal and appliances, similarly, we get a little bit of a rebate for the uh, more valuable metals, but mostly we're, um, you know, we're just taking anything that comes. This woman here is recycling some old fencing. We do ask again for um, you know residents to do the separation for us. If it comes in and it goes into the um, the roll offs that you saw in the first in the first uh, frame, it's too late. You know we try to guide and our staff, uh, Larry, Jonathan, Antoine, all of our other wonderful wonderful team members that we have here try to guide and instruct residents on where they can separate their materials for recycling, but it's really up to us as individuals to do that waste characterization study, know what you're throwing away, know what can be recovered. Next slide. And then chances are we can handle it for you. Um, can't do a presentation without talking about food waste. I don't know what would happen. I'd probably break out in a rash if I had to, but uh, it is by far the um, the heaviest and the most volatile of the material that goes through the um, the transfer station, and it is easily recoverable. Literally one, two, three. If you own your own home, you can compost in your backyard. Um, this is my uh, home composter that's next to my house. I've had it for about 20 years. I'm not even kidding. I've moved with it on several occasions. Um, and it's just a mix of carbon and nitrogen. Carbon comes from dry brown woody material, such as brown leaves. Uh, if you live in the city of Durham, then you know that the willow oak is the national tree of Durham. And I have a couple in my yard, so I set those leaves aside this time of year so that I have that carbon available all summer long. The nitrogen comes from my food scraps. Uh, I mix them together 
about three to one by volume or 50-50 depending on the time of year and then uh, mix it up you want to have about two to three feet build up to get a, a critical mass a critical mass will allow you to have a chemical reaction with the carbon and nitrogen in the presence of water that is where you get a hot compost you can create your own digester in your own backyard you can compost your own food scraps if you don't have a yard, you can compost with worms. Maybe in May, we will do, a do, do another webinar on composting for a compost awareness week. I would love that. Um, cover it up with a layer of carbon just to keep odors down and flies off. This sign is from our composting demonstration site that we have here at the City of Durham uh, Solid Waste Administrative Building. And I um, teach classes a couple of times a year using that demonstration site. Next slide. So we did mention yard waste. I saw a question fly through. What happens to our yard waste? Well, here is a picture from our uh, security camera of our yard waste facility. It gets ground and then our um, we have a contractor, a company called Atlas Organics that grinds our yard waste and then brings it down to the water management facility right next door where it gets composted with the city's biosolids from the North Durham wastewater treatment plant. Now, ordinarily, biosolids would be land applied, that is, without composting, it would go on agricultural fields, not used to grow food. But in this case, for the city of Durham, um, it took a while, but eventually uh, Atlas was able to move into the water management sheds, little by small, bit by bit, build more and more windrows. They use a system called erratic, uh, aerated static piles, ASPs, and so these piles are on PVC pipes that have holes in them, they are literally attached to uh, blowers that blow air up through the piles and keep them aerated so they don't need to be turned as often and the material breaks down very quickly. And that bottom picture, you can see the brown gold that, um, that they make out of the city's yard waste and the city's biosolids. Um, and uh, they sell it as a class A compost suitable for any um, any gardening or landscaping uh, activity, not just agricultural fields that don't grow food. You can grow food with us. All right, I think that's my last slide. Next one, yeah. Any questions, we'll save them to the end, but we are definitely here to help. Please come and visit us. Thank you so much, Muriel. Chrissy, you are up. Okay, thanks. So I work with uh, Durham County Solid Waste. So Muriel is with the city, I'm with the county, um, probably one of the biggest confusions I have all day long is whether or not people live in the city or the county. So I just wanted to start with that real quick. Um, so next slide, I only have two. So. <laughs> all right, so um, our office primarily serves the unincorporated portion of Durham County. So in this map, that's the white portion. Uh, the red portion is the city limits. So if you, have a house or a home outside of the city limits, then on your property uh, tax bill, there'll be an additional solid waste fee. So you might live in the city and pay Durham County taxes, but you don't pay that solid waste fee and that's sort of the difference. So those residents who pay that solid waste fee get a solid waste sticker or decal in their property tax bill. And then that decal is used or shown when you go to one of our convenience sites to use those facilities. So if you're in the city limits though, but you want to use our facilities, um, you can purchase that decal from the tax office. The current fee is $166. And then you can use that for the, we go on a fiscal year, um, but really it's valid until the next property tax bill comes out because that's how you get them. So we honor them. Um, so while it's technically July 1 to June 30th, the tax bill comes out in August. So whenever you purchase the decal, it's good until that time in August. But anyway, so our three convenience sites, um, we're currently in the process of upgrading our convenience sites. So that top star is our new site. It's the Northern Durham convenience site. Um, it replaced the Bahama and Rougemont sites. We just opened that in August. Um, it's And it's right up uh, 501 North between Bahama and Rougemont. Our other convenient site, that middle star, that's our Redwood convenient site. It's about a mile away from the Redwood exit that's on um, 85. 
And then that bottom star, that's our Parkwood convenience site. It's by uh, Highway 55 and TW Alexander. So you can go to our website if you need the exact locations and hours, but um, that's kind of where we're spread out for the sites. So at these locations, um, we of course take trash and yard waste, uh, but today we're talking about recycling. So I'm gonna focus a little bit more on that side of it. We do accept co-mingled recycling. So all those things that Kevin mentioned, um, the metal cans, uh, bo uh, plastic bottles, tubs, jars, paper, cardboard. We do have a program at the convenience sites to recycle the glass bottles and jars separately. And we strongly encourage and would love for residents to do that. Um, but we got, sometimes we got like bigger fish to fry as far as enforcement goes out at the sites. But if you, if you can, please do put the bottles and jars separately. That's the heaviest part of our commingled stream. And uh, commingled is costs us money to recycle. So it's just as a one way of us to reduce our costs is to have that glass separate. And we have a partnership with Orange County. So we bring them our glass bottles and jars and then they mix it with their glass bottles and jars and take it directly to a glass manufacturer. So it's a good program and, and helps save us money. Also helps get more of the glass recycled. You know, sometimes if your glass bottle breaks then the little shards are gonna fall off somewhere else. Um, you know, might get lost in some of the sorting process, but, uh, but this way the glass all just goes straight to the glass folks. So uh, in addition to that kind of traditional commingled recycling, we also have the textile recycling. And I know um, Kristen is coming up later to talk more about that, but basically, you know, your clothes and linens, bring them on. Um, we have that bin at each of our sites. We do take motor oil, oil filters and antifree. So if you change your own oil, you can bring that to us um, with your decal. We also do cooking oil. So if you're frying your turkey, we'll take that. Um, the scrap metal, this has been mentioned, but that really needs to be um, definitely separate from your recycling, but also should be separate from your trash. We get a lot of tons of uh, scrap metal every year. So this could be, uh, if you have an old you know, metal chair or some kind of you know, outdoor furniture that's metal, if you have a rusty grill, uh, an old fire pit, um, you know, we had a in our house, like a, one of those big umbrellas that didn't survive a storm. And so all those, you know, all that metal that came off of it, you know, that is scrap metal. So definitely separate that so it can be recycled, doesn't need to go in the trash and it'll clog up the machines of the mark. So definitely doesn't go there. And then we also take the uh, fluorescent bulbs and tubes as well. Um, so in addition to our convenience sites for unincorporated residents, we also have curbside recycling. Same rules apply, um, please separate your glass, but it is optional. If you put glass in your car, it's not a glass bottle or jar, it's not considered contamination. But if you go to our sites, you know, happy for you to separate that out. We actually even have little bins that you can get from the convenient site attendants to help haul your glass back and forth. Um, we have an app, it's called Durham County Recycles. So if you download that app on your phone, you can put in your address and it'll give you pickup reminders so um, sometimes it's hard to remember when, when is recycling week, but grab the app and you'll be good to go. So again, that's Durham County Recycles. This works on a Android or Apple. Um, and we contract with the company GFL for that service. So the carts that we use for recycling, they're either dark green or bright green, and they'll have either a waste industries or a GFL logo. So sometimes that confuses people a little bit as well, but that program, that recycling program is paid for through your solid waste fee. Um, and so some of the biggest challenges that we have with our recycling program is contamination, like it's been mentioned. So um, I saw a couple of questions about the recycling numbers. When it comes to plastic, just don't even worry about it. That number is telling you what type of plastic it is, not necessarily that it's recyclable. So when it comes to plastic, just remember like bottles, tubs, jugs, and jars, and then you're safe. Don't worry about the numbers. Um, and the plastic bags, we see that a lot as well. Just remember, take them back to the grocery store. And when you do, you know, it's not just plastic bags you can put in there. You can put other types of plastic, like the film around your uh, uh, toilet paper rolls, you know, that comes in film, or you buy a bunch of paper towels that comes wrapped in film, or bread bags, mm -hmm. clean, so, uh, clean Ziploc bags, clean and dry Ziploc bags. Yeah, yeah. So all those are could be recycled with your 
plastic bags at the grocery store. So there's a website, it's plasticfilmrecycling.com. And so they kind of list out all the different types of plastic that you can take back to the grocery store and recycle there. Some of those programs stopped with COVID, but you know, I still see them at the Harris Teeter and Food Line that I go to. So you could still should be able to still bring them there. And uh, just another little sidebar on those lithium ion batteries. That's a really serious thing at our new convenience site. Uh, somebody put a bunch of vape pens in with the trash and then and that has those batteries in it and then another person put in a pressure washer and so when we compacted it together the uh, gas from the pressure washer met up with the fine batteries and we had a fire on like day two of our site so uh, you know watch, watch out for those batteries there there's something else but um but that's it for me so um and I'll you know look forward to questions later Thank you so much, Chrissy. Mm -hmm. Okay, Meredith, you are up next. Um, thanks for having me, guys. Um, we're a little bit different from everybody that's spoken to you so far. We're with Shymar Recycling. We are a private um, recycling service provider. And the majority of what we do, we're, we work with businesses. We provide the services that the city and the county and so forth provide to your household. We provide those to businesses. But we do have a few things um, in our um, services that we provide to consumers or to the public. Um, and we appreciate the opportunity to let you know about these if you don't and if you haven't already visited us. Um, the primary thing that people use us for is for drop off shredding. So a lot of people I saw in the questions, what do we do with our bags of shred and so forth? This isn't necessarily, this is not what we're talking about in, in that regards. This is a service for you to come and shred materials with us, um, you know, rather than drop off um, bags of shred and so forth. But um, we do um, allow customers to come to us. Um, if you call in advance, you'll see most of my slides are the information that you need. So if you take a picture of them or do whatever, um, that's all the information you need to be able to come to us. But we, um, you can bring it to us anytime, 8.30 to 3.30, Monday through Friday, um, but we can't guarantee you see it shred. To witness it shredded, you need to call us on the day that you want to come and we'll let you know our hours. We don't always have hours every day because um, we're always processing materials from our business customers. And sometimes we have to shut down the or you know switch over the baler to other things because we shred, as you see that picture there is just the shred going straight up into the um, conveyor belt and straight into a bale and that's and that's the way we do things so in order to see it shred you, we have to be able to to process and work the baler that way so that's something there is a fee for the service but you can't beat it that if you've checked out some other um, options in the area um, it's, you know, it's just a minimum of $10. Um, happy for you to bring that from, you know, your neighbors and so forth and consolidate it to maximize that as much as possible. And that's even um, a better way to do it. And we even have a, you know, a frequent, a frequent shredder card that allows you to get, you know, a free $10 shred every um, five shreds or so. So that's always um, available there and, and there when you know the city and county hasn't had our free shred events in a while and we hope to have those again someday but um in the meantime this is an easy way to do it and a lot you don't have to wait in line typically to have that done so um that's the drop off shredding um next slide is our on-site services this is not very cost effective but can be good for shred events for the community and so forth um, you know, so you can see some pricing up there of what that is currently. Um, but this is basically us bringing one of our on-site trucks directly to you um, and shredding right there on site. Um, sometimes we can get our trip fees down a little bit um, if you just can't get it to us, which is by far the most um, cost-effective manner. Um, so if we can schedule you on a route, but our routes are pretty full, so this can be a little bit challenging um, for us to do as well. So um, you can see the pricing. Um, oh, back with the drop off. Um, if you end up bringing us electronic kind of stuff, like a, um, we can't shred hard drives, but if there's some non paper items in that, um, you know, like a, 
old discs or something. We can shred those, but we like them to kept, be kept separate um, from that. And we like everything that goes into our trucks and into our shredding to be paper um, and not to be um, other things. Um, we do get um, lots of items sometimes because I don't know if you, when I throw my stuff in on a weekly basis, you know, just the stuff that I want to be shredded into my recycling bin to bring in, a lot of times it has, um, you know, it, it's right next to something else and people will throw um, again, batteries, they'll throw pins. I've seen, you know, various pieces of clothing, this, that, and the other. So um, be careful about that. So, um, but yes, mostly it's just um, paper, um, what we can, we call office paper type of stuff, but it's okay to have a little bit of glossy in that. We don't like that to get up a lot um, high in content um, for glossy materials just because, you um, it downgrades the paper and that helps us keep our prices low if we can keep the paper at an office paper grade level and so forth. So um, paper clips, small binder clips, staples, all that kind of stuff is, is completely acceptable, um, but do um, unwrap things in plastic of any kind for those shredding um, with us. The other items that we collect from the public is EPS Oh, that didn't turn out very well. Sorry about oh, that. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, but EPS and EPE foam. So the, the picture on your left is just normal styrofoam, which is the EPS foam. And it's, um, it's very rigid. And the one on the right is more of a flexible, you can bend it. Um, and it's called EPE. Um, we can, you can bring this to us mixed up. It's okay. It doesn't have to be separated, but we do recycle both of them and we, we will ultimately have to separate them to get recycled, but it's pretty easy to do. Um, we can, you can drop this off more conveniently Monday through Friday, 830 to 330, um, at our location. Um, and we do charge again for this. Um, it's pretty uh, minimal. Again, it's best to consolidate with other people or to save it up if you can, because you can get a full 95 gallon cart, which is the same as your household um, recycling bin, um, you know, worth for just $5. Um, we do ask that if it's under $10 total that you do pay in cash versus um, running a credit card, but we do accept credit cards for $10 and above. Um, we prorate everything per 50 gallon or half a cart's worth after that first 95 gallon cart. Um, so what's important here is that it not be food grade. Um, we don't take your meat trays or the, the take home containers that you might get from store um, restaurants and so forth. It's only the packaging uh, foam that we do that. Um, in addition, we don't take tape or labels or anything like that. Please have those off before you bring us the material. Um, anything else? No peanuts. Peanuts often are pink, blue, green, and made with all sorts of things. We ask you not to do that as well. Um, note on here, directions with us. It's not always clear where to come, but just drive to the back of our warehouse and come up and you don't see anybody that's there to help you, which they're all very, um, very, very helpful, but um, just ring the doorbell and we'll come down and help you with that. But those are the services we offer to the public and we hope that you can take advantage of them um, whenever you can. We look forward to seeing you. Thanks, Meredith. All right, and last but definitely not least, uh, we have Kristen with Green Zone. Thanks, John. You can go on to the next slide. So um, Green Zone is a textile recycler. As uh, Christine and Muriel mentioned, we do have bins at the Durham City and Durham County Convenience Centers. Um, they are tanglers. They don't go in your curbside recycling bin. I have had people call and ask if they can put their shirt in their curbside bin. You cannot. Um, it makes up, the EPA estimate textiles make up about 8% of landfilled municipal solid waste, so there's a good chunk. Um, there is some portion that is recycled, and that's where Green Zone comes in. Go to the next slide, please. So the quantities of textiles have increased rapidly over the past 20 years. I think this is a surprise to no one. Um, and although the rates of recycling are increasing, the rates of quantities landfilled are really way too hard to keep up with. Next slide. 
So what we do is we collect with um, those bins. So you saw the backside of one of our bins on the city of Durham uh, security camera there. Um, we also have events. So we'll do like the city of Durham will have a shredding and textile collection event sometimes. Um, and then we also do pick up from stores. So a lot of times thrift stores will have way too much stuff and they will need um, a textile collector to come pick it up. Now, all we do is collection. I know the name says recycling. It's a mistake. We shouldn't have done that. We are collectors. What happens to our stuff after it is collected, um, if you want next slide for me, Don, um, is that we sell this. So that's how we can pay the city and the county for what we're picking up from them. So we're, we're selling this to people who go through it and sort through the clothing. It's called credentialed clothing, what we sell. So almost all of textile materials, so long as it's not wet and moldy, can be recycled. The vast majority of it, um, maybe, well, so about half is going to be resold. And then the other half is going to be cut down into wipers. Um, usually that's cotton. And that'll be taken to places like auto mechanic shops will buy it for their gas bills or whatever. And then the rest is going to be shredded down into what they called shoddy. So shoddy is shredded fibers that's used in all sorts of things from home insulation to sometimes those insulating packages and the food coolers will have textiles. Um, so that's where it comes from. And I think that's it I had for slides. Um, Dawn, I figured I'd keep it short and let y'all get some questions. Yeah, um, and I wanted to, we can real quickly go through these slides. Um, thank you guys so much for all of that great information. Um, I wanted to add a couple of notes about other awesome businesses, nonprofits, and groups um, that are helping to tackle the waste issue here in Durham. So we just talked about ways to recycle. There are other ways. Um, for starters, there's a brand new um, business called the Recollective that actually offers um, curbside recycling of hard to recycle items for a fee. I strongly encourage you to go and check out their website. And then, um, you know, things that can't be recycled, but they can be reused. It's really great to take them to places like the Scrap Exchange. They're super, super awesome. Uh, Trosa Habitat for Humanity and the Durham Rescue Mission all take items, um, like lightly used items, you know, lamps, furniture, home decor, clothes, shoes, all of that stuff. Um, one of the things that I really like to do personally is utilize buy nothing groups on Facebook. There's a really um, popular one that has about 8,000 people using it called Bull City Shares on Facebook, where you can post things that you don't want anymore that don't need to go to the trash. And then somebody will come and take it. As they say, one man's trash is another man's treasure or woman. Um, and then there's also a listserv that I recently discovered called the Durham Free Cycle Listserv. And you can see the link there. And I will send all of these slides out to you guys with the recording after this. And then another great thing to do is just reduce the amount of things that you need to recycle or throw away to begin with. Um, you, some of you have probably heard of green to go It's a really great um, service that several Durham restaurants utilize um, so that you don't have to take home uh, basically disposable, um, disposable fast food containers. And then you can go to bulk stores like Part and Parcel or the Durham Co-op where you can bring your own container to fill up um, like regular household food items with. Um, oh, and I totally forgot. Um, Oh my gosh, Muriel, help me out. My brain is blanking. Uh, the soaps and stuff. Fillery. Fillery, yes. I can't believe I forgot to put that Fillery <laughs> is another, <laughs> another really great option for like soap, shampoos, um, and other toiletry items. And then bringing your own bag. Um, it's another really, really great way. And then just, um, you know, bringing your own coffee, coffee mug or your own water bottle and just thrifting for things. Um, even for those reusable coffee mugs and water bottles, um, I have found so many great things um, at the scrap exchange. Like I found a really great coffee mug that I use all the time. Okay, and then again, this um, slide with the um, links, I'll send out to you guys afterwards. Okay, time for questions. Don't know if um, Chrissy or Muriel, if you guys want to help me 
field and announce some of the things. We are at 1230, so we understand if people have to go. Um, but if you want to stick around for some questions, that would be awesome. I think it would be really helpful for Kevin maybe to drill down into the plastics. There were a number of questions about um, the resin identification code and the types of plastics. Uh, one in particular was uh, mentioned um, food service items, you know, trays and things like that. They're not bottles, tubs, or jars. Can you take them or no? Sure. We primarily stick to the bottles, tubs, or jars. I mean, food waste containers um, that we, we're not taking at, at this point. Um, and, you know, the, the numbers are, are there. Um, I, I kind of tell people, you know, the good stuff. Your PET containers and your HDP containers or tubs or jars, whatever they are, um, they have a good value to it. And if, if people focus on, on those, that, that is extremely helpful to the overall um, recycling program. And, and PET is going to be your soda bottles, your drink bottles, your water bottles, your HDPE containers are going to be your milk jugs, your detergents, some um, shampoo bottles, uh, with more of a hard plastic. That help. Yeah, I, and I wanted to mention too, um, I'm pretty sure that the Recollective, um, as well as uh, companies like anything with a plug, will accept some of those plastics that people are prone to want to put into the recycling that don't actually go into the recycling, like plastic clamshells, yogurt cup, or actually are yogurt cups um, something, Kevin, that can be, I mean, Muriel's giving me a thumbs up, so have a big stack of those that I feel like I've been, I need to put in there that I've been saving. Yeah, your cups are okay. Awesome. Um, and I saw some questions about like thin paper, like gift, um, like, um, like you would find in a gift bag or like tissue paper, napkins, things like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, napkins, tissue paper cannot be uh, put into the recycling bin. It, it's not what we call regular paper. So please keep that up. Okay. I will note that um, napkins, especially unbleached napkins, I usually just put straight into my compost at home. Um, and Dolly Daniel asked, what about lids on bottles or jars? Yeah, you know, that, that's a, a question we get asked all the time. I, again, lids are fine. If they're on there, if they're off, it, it's fine also. I mean, just it, sometimes those, those small lids on a PET bottle will come off in the process and, and get through the screens and end up um, in, in the waste area or in our glass. So either, I, I tell people take their lids off if you can. Okay, and then things like straws, I know I'm pretty sure are not supposed to go in your curbside bin, but, and I'm not sure if they're even something that there are other people that will collect. Uh, I, I'm not sure, but if, if you go back to, to my slides and, and the bottles, tubs, jugs, or jars, yep. and then the, the paper products also. Okay. Um, Tetra packs. Tetra packs. Yeah. Like these these kind of cartons. Yep, those are fine. That is, there's a visual of that in the, on the the paper side. Uh, we, we I think it's a soup container that's in there, an OJ container. Great, I did not know that's what they were called. Um, someone asked if you could clarify exactly how clean items must be before being put into the recycling. Yeah, I, what I tell people is use your best judgment. Um, I think I saw a note about a peanut butter um, container and, and yes, it's hard to, extremely difficult to clean it out. Uh, we ask people to clean the containers out the best they can. If, if there's no product in there, when, when the plastic gets to the the processor, we, we don't actually process the plastic, we sort it, bail it, and then there's a separate company that will actually break it down into five pieces and resell it. When it gets to that stage, they, they will clean it up further, but it, it's our job to educate the public to go ahead and, and go ahead and clean it the best you can. You know, I, I don't expect someone to spend five minutes cleaning it out a peanut butter jar, but you know, if it's a, um, a glass bottle and there's a tomato sauce in there, that, that's extremely easy to clean out, rinse it out. Um, so that's kind of where, where we are with it today. Okay, um, I have a really important 
question that speaks to something that um, I heard mentioned but not really talked about regarding contamination and its effect on recycling um, as a business. Uh, someone wants to know if you ever discard entire blue bins of recycling or trucks because of contamination. Yeah, um, we're not the collector, so we don't discard the blue bins, but if, if a truck comes to us and it's contaminated, it's, we're not gonna find out until that truck actually dumps on our ticket floor. And several of you on this call have, have been to our facility, so you know what I'm talking about. For those that don't know, um, it, we have no idea what's in that truck until it's dumped on our floor. So if it's if we deem it's contaminated, we'll go ahead and, and load it up into a, a container that's going to the landfill. And we'll discuss that with the, the company that brought in the contaminated load. But we we want to rely on the public, not put the, the incorrect items in the bin, and we rely on the collectors also to identify bins that are contaminated before they even go into the truck. I'll, I'll add to that. Um, so the city of Durham, you saw the transfer station with the recycling and the MSW bays, they're separate and they go to separate places. However, um, you know, the Sunoco does have a, a surcharge for contamination for uh, municipalities that bring material to them. So when there is contamination, they have to pay to separate it out. They have to manage it. And so the municipality ends up paying for that contamination. It's, you know, um, anything that we can do to really just stick with what is on those charts, stick with the pictures. Everybody wants to do a little bit more, you know, a little bit extra. It's not really doing anybody any favor because he, you know, it needs to be separated out and discarded. Leaning into reuse, you know, even, you know, bringing your own straw, as crazy as that sounds, I have one in my bag. It's okay. Um, but I will also say that the city of Durham will backhaul. So we bring our full trucks of recycling from the transfer station, and then we backhaul contamination and take it to the landfill. So that's a, an arrangement that we've worked out with, with Sunoco so that um, it helps reduce our, you know, it just helps manage the material in a more, you know, so we're not bringing back empty trucks and they're sending stuff to the landfill anyway. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's not beautiful, but it it's a little better. The mur mural set up best. I mean, it, in, in a roundabout way, I kind of put that on my slide and wishful recycling. If you have to think about it, generally it, sh it ends up should go in the trash bin. And yeah. there's a question. Out, that, throw it out. Yeah, there. That, that's the terminology. Thank you. Um, please describe contamination. Anything that shouldn't go in the bin. Um, if, if you know it's a plastic bag, shredded paper food waste, textile waste, it, it's all considered contamination. Yeah, and it's important to remember that at the end of the day, recycling is a business. Um, and if we want it to continue to be something that we can utilize to help reduce the amount of things that are going to the landfill, we need to do the best that we can do to prevent contamination, to make sure that it is still profitable so that people like Kevin and Meredith and Kristen um, can still provide that service. Um, another quick question about what can and cannot go. Um, the Sunoco graphic says no aluminum foil. The Durham Waste Wizard says yes to aluminum foil. Which one is correct? So we, we advertise no aluminum foil. We, we do recognize that people will put that in the bin and sometimes we're able to capture that in our um, aluminum cans. But we there's certainly, um, it's, Sometimes it's going to go in the landfill, but sometimes it'll get captured with aluminum cans. So I like to tell people no aluminum foil. I uh, think one of the, if I can, I'm sorry, Kevin. No, go ahead. Uh, one of the biggest problems with aluminum foil is that it's contaminated with food. And so, um, you know, having clean foil, uh, I mean, aluminum, aluminum foil recycles just fine with aluminum cans. And I don't do education anymore. I'm on the disposal side now, as you observed, but uh, I would tell people if you have an aluminum pan, you know, something like that, so long as it's free of food, you can ball it up and it'll mimic an aluminum can in the sorting facility. That material still responds to what they call an eddy current. Correct me if I'm wrong, Kevin. Don't be but, right. 
the big issue is food contamination and then also is it large enough and bulky enough to actually imitate a can so if you fall if you fit into those two criteria this is why we're here the real recyclers of durham mm -hmm. county <laughs> and uh, I, I need to jump off, but um, certainly appreciate y'all letting me uh, talk to this group this morning. And, and uh, if you have any further questions, you can drop me an email if you'd like. Yeah, thank you so much for coming, Kevin. And again, um, if anybody needs to drop off, that's absolutely fine. Um, I'm fine to stay and answer a couple more questions. Um, I don't know if Muriel and Chrissy are available. But um, again, like this is still recording and we'll send it to everybody afterwards. Thanks, everybody. Um, someone made a comment. I've seen the greatest reduction in my trash amount by subscribing with Compost Now. Um, I, will, I had hoped to get more into compost with this, but maybe next time. And as Muriel mentioned, she might do, we might do another webinar in, is it May that's compost month? Uh, the first week in May is Compost Awareness is International, excuse me, International Compost Awareness Week. It's also known as ICA. Um, but generally, um, I know that uh, Wake County and other um, locales start selling compost bins earlier in the spring. Uh, you can get a home composter from Orange County. Uh, they sell them at cost. So there's lots of ways to start composting in your backyard. Um, like I, I mentioned on my slide, but yeah, I would be delighted to talk about all things organics. Along those lines, there was a question about small bits of paper. Um, I'm cautious about the kind of paper that I put in my compost personally. Um, you know, if it's uh, office paper or, um, you know, uh, newspaper, magazines, things like that, um, that can be readily recycled, the paper fiber, energetically it's better to take paper and make paper with it especially when you can use um, leaves and things like that in your compost small bits of paper probably aren't going to do any harm however um, uh, the you know inks and binders and things like that aren't necessarily great for your backyard compost um, paper towels like you mentioned you know that are undyed small fibers those can go in no problem and they can't be recycled so composting is a good way to manage that material uh, someone asked, how do we get some of that brown gold, Muriel? Oh, that's such a great question. Um, so Atlas sells large loads. If you have a dump truck, you can give them a call and they'll load it up for you. Um, we're not really set up to take smaller loads in that. Um, I do know that Brooks uh, is another local um, composter. They're in uh, Chatham County. You mentioned Compost Now. That's where they bring their compost that they collect at your house. They haul it to Chatham to be composted there. And Brooks sells their compost at the Durham Farmers Market and other places around the Triangle because they do have a bagging facility at their composting operation. Awesome. Um, a couple of questions for Kristen. Is textile collection only for clothing or can people recycle linens? And um, I wanted to add to that. I saw recently something about nothing with stuffing. Is that correct? <laughs> yeah, stuffing is mostly plastic. Um, so that's an issue for another day. So, um, so, so stuffing like small stuffed things would be okay. Like we do do some resale of stuffed toys. So if you have like small stuffed toys, you may put them in the bin. Um, and that's also kind of a point of clarification. So our main business is in clothing and shoes, but you are also welcome to put in linens and like small um, pillowcases, towels, that sort of thing can all go in the bin and those will go off with the clothing. But we do also accept small stuffed toys um, and small plastic toys. Um, so there you go. Okay. Um, I don't know if, Muriel, if you are also looking at the questions. There's a lot, and I want to answer as many of them as possible. I'm not sure if there's any that are particularly more pressing. There's one about uh, bubble wrap and packaging bubbles, um, but those can also go to the grocery store with your plastic bags. Yeah. So any kind of stretchy plastic, um, so bread bags, produce bags, Ziploc bags, um, anything like that. Um, it has, stretching is what's important and it has to be clean and dry. So if you wash it out, 
make sure you wash it out completely and let it dry before you put it with the rest of the film. And then you can take all of that um, along with your plastic grocery bags to a grocery store that will accept them. I take mine to Harris Teeter. So I, so there's two other questions here that I find are interesting. Um, someone asked about their apartment building that collects their recycling in plastic bags and where does that go? Um, I would say to that participant, ask your apartment building who's taking it and where they're taking it. Uh, Kevin mentioned in his talk that um, recycling that is bound in a plastic bag is unlikely to be opened and processed in his facility. So if an apartment building is collecting plastic in plastic bags, either they're debagging it somewhere, hopefully, that's what they should be doing, or if it's going to the MRF bagged up, whether it's being recycled or not is a big question mark. Awesome. Um, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, take these questions from the chat and put a blog post on our website and try to get as many of them answered as possible. Um, so you can go to our website, um, which is just keepdurandbeautiful.org and go to our blog page. Um, I will try to send some of the separate them out to the people that I think could answer them best and then Hopefully that'll be up by the end of the week. And then by the end of today, I'll send everybody this recording as well as the slides. Um, and then you're always welcome to um, send us a message to info at keepdurandbeautiful.org. Um, Muriel and Chrissy, I don't know if there are, I think the app you mentioned is a really great way to get your questions answered for the city or the county. I think so. It was on one of my slides. I feel like it, it missed it somehow. Um, just really quick, there are still questions about the food to go containers like black trays and things like that. They're really not recyclable. There isn't a good market for them. The thing that determines whether an item is recyclable or not is not the three chasing arrow symbol on it, unfortunately. That's a plastics industry trademark and they put it on absolutely everything, whether it's, you know, um, whether there's a recycling market for it. When I say something's recycled, what I mean is that it gets sold to a remanufacturer made into a new product that can be sold back into the marketplace. For example, plastic bottles can be melted down to make fiber to make carpeting, like what I'm sitting on here or the polar fleece that someone I'm sure is wearing. That is, you know, plastic bottles have markets here in North Carolina. Black plastic trays do not. They don't separate well. They don't have they don't have um, reliable markets, so they're not being collected for recycling because they don't have an end market. That's really what determines whether something's recyclable or not. If you want to support recycling markets, purchase products that are made from recycled content. Exactly, and also um, I sort of went over it really quickly. Um, a lot of people think about the three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle. There's actually five. And the first one is refuse. So if you can, um, someone mentioned um, how to get businesses like small and big businesses to think about these sorts of things. And it's a, a, it's a vote with your dollar type of thing. Um, don't buy those things um, like the meat that comes on a black styrofoam tray wrapped in plastic. Um, that's one really great way to reduce your own waste and also to send a message to companies that you do not want those items. Um, but re, uh, refuse, reuse, reduce, then recycle, and then lastly, rot. So those are the five R's. <laughs> rot refers to compost. Okay, it's uh, almost half an hour after we said we would end. So I'm gonna go ahead and say thank you so much to everybody that came. Thank you so much for your time. Um, Richard Pierce, I think LED bulbs can go to um, Muriel, right? I just saw that one last, <laughs> that last pop up. <laughs> LEDs are not, uh, they don't have anything in them that's considered hazardous, so you can just dispose of those in your regular trash. All right, that one last question. Thank you guys so much. Um, I'll send you all of this information uh, later on today. Thank you so Great much. Great job, John. Thank you, everybody. Good to see you. Bye. Thanks, John. Thanks. Thank you.